Now in the middle of our 22nd year of service to the amateur radio community all around the world, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1182 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The Golden Globe Sailing Race, which circumnavigates the globe, has banned entrance from using amateur radio. The CQ Worldwide Youth category will debut with this year's event coming up soon. The Federal Communications Commission approves wireless power transfer technology on 900 megahertz. The latest volunteer monitoring report has been released and we will have all the details. United Nations Day transmissions from Sweden's SAQ alternator is set for October 24th. You can enjoy two weekends of fun during the ARRL November sweepstakes on the air. An amateur radio digital communications grant will fund two new amateur radio projects. Amateur radio supports the Chicago Marathon. We will have all the details. And can an amateur radio handheld stop an oncoming train? We will have the answer in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will take a nostalgic look back at the early search engines on the internet and we'll take a look at how the internet and big tech are both good and bad. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will look at the inherent redundancy of a compromised antenna. Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill opens up his playbill for Part 2, or Act 2, of the VHF Battle of the 1940s. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will have some tips on general antenna mounting on your tower. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in beautiful downtown Albany, New York, where they're telling us we're going to have four or five days of rain coming up, I'm George W2XBS. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau in Cortlandville, New York, where there's a nip in the air and the smell of pumpkin spice lattes is everywhere. Yuck. I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from our news bureau in Rochester, New York, along the southern shore of Lake Ontario, I'm Dave Wilson, WA2HOY. And reporting from our Halloween's Ace station in the Catskill Mountains of upstate New York, where we're getting ready for Pumpkin Day by watching a lot of Hammer films on television. I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And reporting from our Troy, New York News Bureau, where just about 50% of the leaves are off the trees, I'm Eric, KD2, RJX. And reporting from our News Bureau in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where we thought we had sent summer packing, well, think again, Pilgrim. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. And now with this week's lead story, here is Terry Saunders, N1KIN. Leading off our news this week, the use of amateur radio by participants in the 2022-2023 Golden Globe race and around the world sailing competition has been banned, according to Yachting Monthly magazine. Race organizers put the restriction in place because of unlicensed use of amateur radio equipment in the 2018-2019 event, Yachting Monthly reported. In the 2018-2019 race, Estonian skipper Uku Ranma, ES1 UKU, was penalized after seeking weather routing, the best route according to wind and weather conditions, via ham radio. While he escaped disqualification, he did receive a 72-hour penalty. Ranma received weather routing information from Bob McLeod, VP8LP, who advised Ranma, the more north you go, the quicker you get out of the wind hole. The race rules say entrants are free to speak to media, family, friends, and sponsors by radio at any time during the event, but must not be given any form of weather routing. 
But in the next sentence, the rules allow competitors to communicate freely by radio or by hailing with other competitors or other mariners on vessels at sea, requesting or giving any verbal information or advice whatsoever, even if this is considered weather routing. The Golden Globe race rules that were spelled out in the notice of race require at least a 125 watt marine medium frequency slash high frequency radio transceiver with a frequency range of at least 1.6 to 29.9 megahertz fitted in a 100% watertight enclosure able to be sealed in any storm with permanently installed antenna and ground and an emergency antenna when the regular antenna depends upon the permanent backstay. The rules make clear that any proven breach of international radio telecommunication regulations, such as transmitting on illegal maritime frequencies, may result in a time penalty. Ham radio transmissions are specifically banned. According to Yachting Monthly, the changes caused concern within the race community, with some of the 2018 entrants highlighting difficulties in picking up global maritime distress and safety system frequencies in the Southern Ocean due to the shrinking of the broadcasting network as more mariners rely on satellite communication. This is a retro race, with skippers restricted to using a sextant, a navigation instrument used to measure altitudes of celestial bodies, paper charts, and wind-up chronometers, just as Sir Robin Knox Johnston used in the first Sunday Times Golden Globe race 50 years ago, race chairman Don McIntyre has explained. In the 2018 race, some Golden Globe race skippers who operated on ham radio frequencies using bogus call signs were asked to stop operating. The Golden Globe race monitors all severe weather with winds over 40 knots and, if appropriate, provides both forecasting and routing information to assist entrants in sailing safely. The yachts are set to sail in September of 2022 for a race that the Yachts and Yachting website calls a grueling, demanding, and daring marathon. The new youth category for the CQ Worldwide DX Contest will debut October 30th and 31st with the phone weekend. The category covers contesters aged 25 years old or younger and applies to both the phone and CW weekends. With more details on this exciting new category, we go to Steve Richards, G4HPE, reporting from Southgate Amateur Radio News. The CQ Worldwide Phone Contest has a new youth category for people aged 25 years or younger. The annual CQ Worldwide Phone Contest on October the 30th to the 31st and the CW Contest on November the 27th to the 28th are great opportunities for young operators to get on the air and contact DX stations from all over the world. This year is special for young operators because of a new youth category for anyone 25 years old or younger. The rules for CQWW can be found at www.cqww.com forward slash rules. The new youth category has created a lot of interest and IARU Region 2 is one of several organisations sponsoring plucks for the top young scorers. There are four plucks, top youth score in South America for both the CQWW phone and CW contests, and similar awards for the top score in North America in both contests. In fact, youth plucks are sponsored for all continents in both the phone and CW contests. Contests are a good way to introduce young people, licensed or not, to amateur radio's ability to communicate around the world. Unlicensed listeners can log all the stations they hear and compare with other shortwave listener logs. On the air, contacts are short and easy to understand. It's just a signal report, almost always 5-9, and a CQ zone from 1 to 40. So even a mic shy person can jump in and be successful. If your club has young operators, please help them to get on the air individually or from a club station as a multi-operator entry or invite a local young amateur to join you in your shack. Certificates are available for everyone submitting a contest log, so every score will be recognised. In Region 2, that's the Americas, stations in South America should see good conditions on 20, 15 and even 10 metres, so smaller stations with modest antennas will still find plenty of stations to work. North and Central American stations will find plenty of European and Japanese stations too. So let's take advantage of good conditions to show our young operators how to have fun with amateur radio. International Amateur Radio Union Region 2, the Americas, is one of the several organizations sponsoring plaques for the top young scorers. In Region 2, plaques will be awarded to the top youth score in each CQ worldwide event in North America and South America 
four in all. Youth plaques are sponsored by other entities for participants from all continents in both events. Unlicensed listeners can log all the stations they hear and compare with the other shortwave listener logs. Certificates are available for everyone submitting a contest log. According to the Business Newswire, the United States Federal Communications Commission has given its approval to wireless charging technology from a San Jose, California company. Energis Corporation sought approval for its 900 megahertz 1 watt active energy harvesting transmitter that enables wireless transfer of power. The U.S. regulatory agency's OK follows similar approval granted in Europe this past May. The transmitter, known as WattUp, is able to charge several devices at the same time and is seen as key to the growth of devices reliant on the Internet of Things. The company heralded the move on its website, praising WattUp as the world's first and only regulatory approved wireless charging technology that supports near and far field wireless power transfer. Here is this month's Volunteer Monitor Program report. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between the ARRL and FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. This is the Volunteer Monitor Program report for September 2021. Technician operators in Mansfield, Ohio, Avon Park, Florida, and Pulaski, Tennessee received advisory notices after making numerous FT8 contacts on 20 meters. Technician licensees do not have operating privileges on 20 meters. A volunteer monitor in Mission Viejo, California, received a Department of Homeland Security United States Coast Guard Certificate of Appreciation for his efforts in locating a defective transmitter on Marine Radio Channel 16 that was blocking emergency communications on that channel. A former licensee in Durham, North Carolina, received an advisory notice for operating under a call sign and license canceled by the FCC. An operator in White Pine, Tennessee, received an advisory notice regarding operation on 7.137 MHz, a frequency not authorized under his general class license. Operators in Swannanoa, North Carolina, and New Albany, Indiana, received good operator notices for exemplary operation during 2021 and for regularly assisting other operators with transmitter adjustments and amateur radio procedures. The Volunteer Monitor Program made one recommendation to the FCC for case closure. The Volunteer Monitor Program statistics for August showed 2,008 hours on HF frequencies and 2,642 hours on VHF frequencies and above for a total of 4,650 hours. Thanks to Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator for this month's report. On United Nations Day, Sunday, October 24th, the vintage and historical Alexanderson Alternator in Grimmington, Sweden, with a call sign of SAQ is scheduled to send out a message to the world on 17.2 kHz CW. The events of the day will be live streamed on YouTube starting at 1425 UTC. Transmitter startup and tuning will begin at 1430 UTC, with a message transmission to follow at 1500 UTC. This year's message was drafted by Swedish human rights lawyer and sustainability expert Parul Sharma. SAQ will conduct some test transmissions on October 22nd from 1100 UTC to 1400 UTC and will be on the air for short periods during this interval. Comments are welcomed at info at alexander.n.se. For guaranteed QSL, use the online report form, which will be open October 24th through November 14. Dating from the 1920s, the Alexanderson Alternator essentially an AC alternator run at extremely high speed, can put out 200,000 watts, but typically is operated at less than one-half that power level. Once providing reliable transatlantic communications, it's now a museum piece and is put on the air for special occasions. The transmitter was developed by Swedish engineer and radio pioneer Ernst Alexanderson, 
who was employed at the General Electric Company in Schenectady, New York, and was chief engineer at RCA. Six 400-foot towers with 150-foot cross arms support a multi-wire antenna for SAQ. The actual signal radiates from a vertical wire, one from each tower. Amateur radio station SK6SAQ will be active on these frequencies. 3.535 MHz CW, 7.035 MHz CW, 14.035 MHz CW, 3.755 MHz SSB, and 7.140 MHz SSB. QSL SK6SAQ via email to info at alexander.n.se via the Bureau, or direct to Alexander GVV Radio Station in Grimmiton 72SE-432 Space 98, Grimmiton, Sweden. Two stations will be on the air most of the time. For guaranteed QSL, use the online request form, which will be open October 24th through November 14th. Meanwhile, members of the Global Service Center, ARC, are now active as 4U24OCT from Brindisi, Italy. The activity to mark United Nations Day, which has been celebrated since 1948. The purpose of the United Nations Day event is to promote to people worldwide the principles of humanity, unity, and world peace. Operations should be on 160 through 10 meters. Remember, this operation only counts for Italy for DXCC. For 36 hours between the 26th and 28th of October, international teams of radio operators will push the limits of their abilities and their radio equipment to compete in an event that military organizers in Canada are calling the world's most prestigious military-led high-frequency radio competition. The exercise, known as Noble Skywave, is a friendly contest among military radio operators and their affiliates to contact other teams, making use of voice and data modes. Teams can comprise radio operators active in various nations' military forces, or they can be in the reserves or National Guard. Operators also participate from the U.S. Military Auxiliary Radio System and the Canadian Forces Affiliate Radio System. This year, more than 150 teams in 10 nations are expected to be on the air, hoping to be crowned the best of the best. Although the majority of participants are in the U.S. and Canada, past exercises have also drawn participation for teams in Australia, the U.K., New Zealand, and Peru. The Communications and Electronics branch of the Canadian Armed Forces has been at the helm of this training exercise since 2013. Lieutenant Taylor Curran of the Canadian Armed Forces 21st Electronic Warfare Regiment said in a statement that his regiment is the lead mounting unit for this event. The Irish Radio Transmitters Society Publications Library contains newsletters and other IRTS publications from 1948 to the year 2000. The library now holds more than 250 publications, which have been scanned and converted to PDF for easy viewing or downloading. The most recent addition to the library is a copy of the August 1960 IRTS News, which was thought to have been lost but was unearthed by Jerry, Echo India 8, Charlie Charlie. The topics covered in the 1960 issue include reports from three field day contest stations in the Dublin area and how the operators overcame a variety of technical and weather related problems. There is also an interesting report on an IARU Region 1 conference held in Folkestone, Kent, during which ERA's IRTS delegation offered to assist VHF operators from other countries to join in an effort to make a VHF transatlantic contact with the east coast of the United States. The IRTS Publications Library is at www.irts.ie forward slash library and is well worth a visit. The IRTS continues to ask members to help to fill in the gaps by lending newsletters or other IRTS publications not currently available in the library so that they can be scanned and added. The president of International Amateur Radio Region 1, Don Beatty, G3BJ, gave an important speech just before the opening of the IARU Region 1 workshop. His speech was entitled, Shaping the Future of Amateur Radio. Here's an excerpt from that speech. Ladies and gentlemen, Colleagues, I want to say a few words now as we start this workshop program. Let me reflect on what's brought us together. From time to time, a number of you have expressed your concerns to me about the position of amateur radio today, 
very often views which are shared by the executive committee. You've said that we need to improve our public relations. You've said that we need to form alliances with other organizations in related fields and so strengthen our position. You've said that we should be recruiting people into amateur radio from other related interest groups. All of these are very valid comments, but I wonder if they overlook one important point. The amateur ra radio that we often talk about today is quite often the amateur radio of the past. If we're to focus on and invest in public relations, or if we're to seek alliances with other organizations, or if we set out to recruit from other parts of the population, don't we need a shared vision of what amateur radio is becoming, or perhaps I should say should become, to have any chance of a credible dialogue with our audiences? In short, I think we need a relevant product to offer to today's generation. Many of you will know that for the last four years, in addition to my role as president, I've been representing IARU in CEPT, looking at the impact of wireless power transmission on radio communication. When I started this work, I was unknown in regulatory forums and was viewed, I think, with suspicion and even perhaps a degree of hostility. But that's now moved to a situation where the input of the amateur service is actively sought on the technical aspects of the impact of WPT. That's taken a lot of time and effort, but it does show that attitudes to amateur radio can be changed. But even so, the personal contribution I've made at the technical level to these regulatory discussions doesn't seem to have changed the underlying view of regulators about the relevance of amateur radio and its social and economic impact. The spectrum we occupy is often viewed as low priority for protection because amateur radio does not matter. If you think about the implications of that, there's a real risk that we're walking towards extinction as the pressures on the radio spectrum increase. So what to do? You may have heard the story of the three bricklayers, but perhaps it's worth repeating now. A man came across three bricklayers working together on a building site. He asked the first man what he was doing, and he replied, I'm laying bricks. He asked the second man what he was doing, and he replied, I'm building a wall. He asked the third man what he was doing, and he replied, I'm building a cathedral. They were all doing the same thing, but the third man had a vision and a purpose. So what's our vision in amateur radio of the cathedral we're building? Do we share a common view? I sometimes wonder. So let me go back to the comments that IARU is not doing enough about our future direction. Firstly, please remember that IARU itself has no people of its own and that our people are your people. What we can do in IARU is to lead by encouraging and supporting work to develop a shared direction of travel and then to try to continually focus everyone in supporting that direction. Be in no doubt, IARU cannot redefine and refocus amateur radio without the active commitment and involvement of you all. So what we decide together this week will give us a shared aiming point. It will shape the future agenda which faces all our member societies and IARU itself. In a number of past ventures, it's clear to me that together we have overcommitted and underdelivered. Finding capable volunteers with both time and the commitment to do difficult and time consuming things on behalf of amateur radio is tough. So whatever we do this week, I advise making realistic commitments and then over delivery. So from this meeting, we don't just need the words, but the actions that deliver the reality of the words. We start on a journey today, which will be both challenging and exciting. In this journey, member societies will need to take a hard look at their leadership teams and decide whether that team has the commitment, energy and determination to carry their society forward. The same applies, of course, to IARU. We need an executive committee that shares the vision and determination to refocus amateur radio to be relevant for the future. So I hope when you come to vote for your executive committee on Sunday next, you will think very carefully about the challenges of the future and equip Region 1 with the best executive committee possible, fully capable 
of carrying forward an agenda that we determine together in the next seven days. We're all keen to start doing things, but we really must avoid the temptation of ready, fire, aim. We need, first of all, that shared view of where we want to take amateur radio. And that's the major part of this week's work. Once we have that shared view, my hope and expectation is that the remaining steps this week will be less stressful to work out what will get us to our aiming point. But please remember that this week is the start of a journey. We'll not have solved all our problems by next Sunday. We must see this event as the continuation of a process which we started earlier this year with the SWOT analysis and which will continue for several years to come. But it will help us to set the direction for the development of the hobby over the next 10 years. Colleagues, change is always difficult. Leadership is particularly challenging when there is transformational change to achieve. <clears throat> we must all have a single-minded sense of direction if we're to have any chance of success. That is the purpose of this week, and I wish everyone success in delivering an outstanding outcome. Almost 140 delegates are taking part in the workshop, which runs from October 15th to the 24th in several breakout sessions where they will work as teams on defining visions and ambitions for amateur radio, strategic objectives, with as end goal, actions, milestones, and deliverables. The amateur radio television community is relatively small and specialized. Ham TV expert Jim Andrews, KH6HTV, had an article in the October 21 QST on the topic. This week, he's been a guest on ARRL's Eclectic Tech podcast with Steve Ford, WB8IMY. Andrew says amateur television has been around for a while, but the use of digital technology has changed things a bit. Going back in the records that I found in old QSTs and stuff, I found the first uh, ham TV uh, transmission dated back to about 1940 pretty much at the birth of TV. So, yeah, hams have been active with it and ever since, and it's uh, it's definitely uh, one of those uh, gifts or blessings from the FCC that allows us to run really wide-band signals, uh, such as television. And when I say wide-band, we're talking typically 6 megahertz of bandwidth. Although that's uh, one thing in the, uh, in the new digital TV, uh, there's been quite a bit of experimentation um, with uh, going to quite a bit narrower bandwidths and uh, some of the uh, equipment that we're normally using with our uh, digital television uh, is capable of just being programmed to run on narrower bandwidth. So um, some of them are running down to maybe as narrow as uh, megahertz or even a little lower than that. Amateur radio television expert Jim Andrews, KH6HTV, speaking on the ARRL Eclectic Tech podcast, which you can access at www.arrl.org forward slash eclectic. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Jump jiving and wailing. Any way that the internet and the computing and digital technology are changing our lives, that's what we talk about right here. And boy, they are, aren't they? It's amazing, really. Yahoo, the original internet search engine, right? It, it originally was uh, human curated. It was like a, li a library catalog for the internet. Which is kind of, <laughs> it seemed like, an, it really from here, it seems like a fairly naive thought that you could have humans keep track of all the websites on the internet. But those of us who used the internet early on remember going to, first, it wasn't yahoo.com. It was created by David Philo and Jerry Yang, a couple of Stanford graduate students. They were using the Stanford servers. Uh, they were big sumo wrestler fans, so the name of the server, and I remember going to it, was Akabono, who was a famous sumo wrestler. Akabono.stanford.edu. And they eventually called it Yahoo, which they kind of made up the name after the fact. Of, it was stood for uh, yet another hierarchically organized oracle. <laughs> <laughs> and do you remember the uh, Yahoo front page? It divided the internet into categories <laughs> and then subcategories. Now, this is a long time ago. 
It's a, it, you know, uh, we're pretty, we're down the line a bit from the first days of the internet. Most of us started using the internet around 20 years ago, 1996. Remember uh, Netscape? That was uh, mid '90s. Um, that that was pretty much when the and it was in 1995, 21 years ago, that the National Science Foundation, which had been running the internet, even even that even that phrase sounds antiquated. As late as 1995, the U.S. government, the National Science Foundation, was running the internet. That was. Theirs. And they, at that time, they were prohibiting commercial traffic. You couldn't do an ad on the internet. Around about 1995, they said, all right, that's fine. We're going to open it up. Uh, nobody's going to own the internet and anything goes. And that, that was when the internet really started to change. There's another big change when AOL, which was uh, until, until this point, kind of the number one way people got online, when America Online uh, suddenly allowed... They call it the summer of AOL. I think it was 96. Flipped a switch that let AOL customers use a browser to surf the internet. And I remember internet old timers, people have been there for a couple of years, uh, were very nervous. They didn't, they didn't like the unwashed masses, the AOL crowd descending on their perfect little internet. Well, it's a very different place now. People are asking, what happened to, what happened to CompuServe? CompuServe, which was kind of a competitor to America Online. There were a few. Uh, there was Genie, remember that? That was run by General Electric. General Electric ran Genie. H&R Block, the tax company, ran CompuServe. They, what they realized is they had all this computing power they were using during the day to do taxes, or in case of General Electric, to design nukes. Uh, but it weren't widely used at night. They said, you know, we could let other people, you know, we let people dial in and use our computers at night and create basically an online service, and that was Genie and CompuServe. Uh, but both faded away. AOL kind of dominated, and then it it was its turn to fade away. Remember the big Time Warner AOL merger? Bringing the internet together with content, and that was the biggest, one of the biggest flops of all time. The one thing constant about technology and about the internet is change. And the thing that uh, is different about it is that it's much more rapid, isn't it, uh, than we're used to. Companies come and go. Oceans rise, empires fall. Just at a rapid pace in just a few years. Even Google, which is what, 15 years old? It's starting to look long in the tooth. Like, it's been around a long time. Old timers. There's Google, guys. <laughs> time to retire. But you know one thing I won't miss from uh, AOL? The disks. The disks. Millions and millions. Maybe, maybe hundreds of millions of CD-ROMs. In the in that uh, mylar wrapper, that's gotta be what? Talking about waste of resources. Seven hundred free hours <laughs> for the first month. <laughs> uh, let's see what else can we talk about? All the rigmarole that we talk about, uh, you know, it's changing our lives, all this stuff. I tell you, I gotta say, yeah, my. <laughs> I like to do a sermon, a weekly sermon. The the thing the, the thing that got me uh, today is I'm seeing this more and more about how you know this this uh, kind of sentiment that's growing that big tech is destroying the world. And while I understand people are very concerned about privacy, let's not become uh, let's not become privacy puritans. You know, privacy is an important thing. It's you know I think it's a very simple answer. To this which is all you got to do is insist, and I think we could do this uh, with legal, uh, you know, with a law that says if a company collects information about users, it, in fact, even if it doesn't, if any, every company that's online or sells products to the, to the end user, and I don't mean just tech companies, any company should state very clearly what information about its customers it collects, what it does with that who it sells it to, that kind of thing. They should be required to keep it secure. There should be penalties for lying, <laughs> severe penalties for lying. Their privacy statement should be accurate and truthful and complete. And there should be penalties for failing to secure that. You know, like what we see nowadays, every company in the world seems to be just leaking information right and left. What was it? AT&T just leaked a bunch of information about its customers. It just seems nonstop. That seems like a simple thing. 
And I think companies are going to want to do this because I think the backlash is starting. And they and they realize that the if they if they don't do that it could be a lot worse, and I don't think a lot worse is good for us because honestly I think technology is changing the world in in a very positive direction in many cases. You know I don't want to be so negative about big tech. I think what Google's doing is amazing. At the same time, you know they need to be told you have to disclose what you're doing and we have to choose and you and you need to give customers the right to choose so that if somebody doesn't want to you know have their information sold or is you know thinks that a company's not doing right by them they have the you know they have the opportunity to say well I'm, that's the called the free market that's what this country's all about i just read an article uh i think it was really actually a scurrilous article in gizmodo today by uh, one of gizmodo's senior editors basically saying if you see a good deal on amazon's ring doorbell on black friday do not under any circumstances buy it do not buy that doorbell, that video doorbell, whatever under, because, and he brings up two things. One is a really old security flaw that was fixed before it ever even became public by Ring that allowed somebody who's, who, if they could unscrew your doorbell <laughs> and take it and, and plug it into the, uh, a device, they could get your uh, Wi-Fi login and password which by itself is not a horrible security violation, but and they had to remove it from the door, and it was fixed before it became public. And yet he's, and it was two years ago. He's using this. He's using the other thing that Ring's been doing, which I think does upset people. Ring's been doing deals with police departments all over the country. Now, I honestly think police departments do this with the absolute best intentions. In fact, I even think Ring did it with the absolute best intentions. The idea is that the video doorbell is capturing video not just of your front porch but also of the street in front of you and that could be useful for law enforcement and ring is making deals with law enforcement we'll give you some doorbells you can distribute to your community because it is good for communities neighborhood policing really does reduce crime and in return you can get the video from any ring uh, doorbell that's the problem and, oh and by the way you have to keep this a secret and that i agree with i agree with the the, the in gadget editor i'm sorry gizmodo editor who wrote this that's not good uh, and that's an example of something that if Amazon were forced to disclose what information it collects and what it does with it, we would have known about it all along. And then you could make the decision. Well, maybe I shouldn't get this doorbell. Unfortunately, uh, they didn't and we and they got caught. And so that gives it a really kind of a nasty, like they're trying to sneak something by. I don't think they are. And honestly, I think there is some value, some real value to having those video doorbells. I replaced it with Google's Nest Hello doorbell a few months ago. Mostly because of the better uh, capabilities of the Nest. I have one of those Google frames. And when somebody comes to my door, the, the Google video camera says, someone's at your front door, shows video. And it does it almost immediately, which was always a problem with ringers, a little slow. You know, took, by the time somebody rang the doorbell and I saw it, they were gone. But with the hello, it's immediate. And if and now here's the thing then, that people are going to get up in arms about this, I guarantee you. One of the features of the Nest Hello Cam is you can identify people's faces. So you can go through all the people who've been to your door and say, yeah, I know them. That's my son. Yeah, that's my wife. Yeah, that's our UPS guy. And then it'll say, Michael's at the door. It'll identify him. Or it'll say an unidentified person's at the door. It even knows if a package has been left. And it'll, it'll say it, and it also send me a notification on my phone. A package was just left at your door. I find that incredibly useful, and I like knowing who's at my front door. And if it's somebody I don't know, I like that even more. I want to know that. If they're sharing it with the world, maybe that's not so good. Maybe my friends and family don't like it if I identify them and then their face recognition information is being shared with somebody like the U.S. government or police departments. Maybe they don't like that. In fact, the Hello Doorbell even says in the software, no, but don't, don't do this <laughs> if it's illegal in your area. <laughs> and then, you know, that's about it. It's the mildest warning ever. I don't have a problem with this. I think this is great. I think there's some real value to it. And this is my, my big problem with people who say, just don't buy this thing. It's terrible. That's not useful. There are a lot of values. There's a lot of value, in my opinion. I want to know what you think. But there's a lot of value, in my opinion, in uh, personal technology. And we're getting things. The world is better in so many respects, so many interesting ways because of technology. And I would hate for us to become Luddites. That's the term. Used, named after uh, a probably probably mythical character named Ned Ludd, who when the jacquard looms were introduced 
in the newly industrialized England in the 17th century, Ned led a revolt of other weavers who were hand weavers saying, oh, these, these are going to put us out of work, and they destroyed the looms. And these people were called Luddites, and today we call Luddites anybody who hates, hates technology just because it's technology. Now, if you were a weaver in the 1600s and you were losing your job to an automated loom, I get, I get why you'd be upset. I do. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have automated looms. In fact, everything you wear today is made on an automated device of some kind. There wouldn't be enough clothes to clothe us. <laughs> and it would be a lot more expensive if they all had to be hand woven. I know my mother was a hand weaver. It took her quite a while to make, <laughs> to make me that, that rug or that sweater. It took a long time. I don't think that's a bad thing to have uh, automated looms. And yes, there's a disruption. There's a technological disruption. If you're a coal miner, I understand why you would be upset that uh, coal is not, you know, it's kind of going out of business. But you know what? There's other people in the world, and, and frankly, uh, coal-fired power plants aren't really that good for the world. And so I'm sorry you lost your job. I am. I really am. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't consider these technological alternatives. That's all I'm saying. Let's not, I hate to, I don't actually like this metaphor I'm using anyway. Let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Anyway, I'm glad you were here and I'm here and I'll be here next week and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends too as we talk high tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives here on This Week in Amateur Radio. In our last installment, we learned that the UHF spectrum above 25 megacycles, which during the 1930s was populated only by amateurs, was now in the center of a battle being fought on many fronts. Amateurs wanted their 10, 5, 2.5, and 1.25 and meter bands back. Major Edwin Armstrong wanted to increase the 42 to 50 megacycle allocation in the new FM broadcast service. General David Sarnoff of RCA wanted huge chunks of VHF space set aside for television as well as limited spectrum for FM, a potential rival. And William Paley of CBS wanted UHF, not VHF allocations, for CBS's color wheel TV system, which they wanted the FCC to adopt as the television standard in lieu of RCA's competing system. In addition to these major players, other minor characters were also clamoring for VHF frequencies. The growing aircraft industry, police departments who were tired of the interference-prone 1700 kilocycle police band and wanted to use FM on VHF, and even businesses to whom the idea of personal two-way communication was now possible. Thanks to the war and the introduction of new VHF and UHF tubes, the frequencies above 25 megacycles were now the most sought-after slice of the RF spectrum. During late 1944, the FCC held hearings on post-war VHF allocations in which there were 231 witnesses and 4,200 pages of testimony. In November 1944, the first proposal on VHF-UHF allocations was released. See if you could live with this. From 23.5 to 27 megacycles, industrial applications. From 27 to 29 megacycles, the amateur 11 meter band. You heard me right. From 29 to 43 megacycles, police, fire, emergency, and local government. 43 to 58 megacycles, FM broadcasting. 58 to 60 megacycles, amateur 5 meter band. Note it's only 2 megacycles wide. 60 to 102 megacycles, TV channels 1 through 7 on the RCA system. 102 to 108 megacycles, non-government emergency, 108 to 132 megacycles aircraft, 132 to 144 megacycles government, 144 to 148 amateur 2 meter band, 148 to 152 government, 152 to 218 megacycles was TV channels 8 through 18, yes up to channel 18 and again the RCA system. From 218 to 225 megacycles would be the amateur one and a quarter meter band, 225 to 420 megacycles would be government. 420 to 450 megacycles would be the amateur 70 centimeter band. 450 to 460 megacycles, facsimile broadcasting. And 460 to 956 megacycles, 
UHF television using the CBS color wheel system. So, under this proposal, our 10 meter band was moved down one megacycle. We would lose one half of our 5 meter band. We lose 112 through 116 megacycles, but gain 144 through 148. Our one and a quarter meter band stays the same, and we gain a large chunk at 420 megacycles. The FM broadcast allocation is increased by 85%. Police agencies leave the crowded 1700 kilocycle area for VHF FM. Aircraft has their piece of the pie, and both CBS and RCA have home turfs to battle out the television standards war. Note also the 450 to 460 megacycle range allocated to facsimile broadcasting. For those of you who think fax machines are a recent invention, it may interest you to know that 70 years ago, a reliable mechanical electrical fax system was in use. By the mid-1940s, it was widely believed that every home soon would have a fax machine. During the night as you slept, the machine would be tuned to various stations in the 450 to 460 megacycle range and would print out the next day's newspapers, magazines, and catalogs for you to read in the morning. Another proposal was for a veterans band, which would be a 2,000 megacycle wide slice of the spectrum above 10,000 megacycles. This proposed band would be available for war veterans and only war veterans in any way they desired. The ARRL was quick to object to the proposed allocations. It was not acceptable to amateurs to move our 10 meter band down one megacycle, to eliminate half of five meters, and to upset the harmonic relationship of our bands by moving us up from 112 to 144 megacycles. The FCC capitulated on 10 and 5 meters, as we will see in a moment. As for the 144 to 148 megacycle band, the FCC was firm. 112 through 116 megacycles was going to aircraft. Furthermore, the FCC wanted our amateur bands above 100 megacycles to be next to government allocations so that in the time of war or national emergency, they could be used for the expansion of essential government radio services. The needs of the government per the FCC outweighed the need for a strict harmonic relationship between the amateur bands. Meanwhile, while the ARRL was arguing over our allocations, General Sarnoff was conducting his campaign behind the scenes. He couldn't eliminate the CBS color wheel UHF system because, at that time, CBS was producing beautiful, lifelike color pictures that impressed the FCC. But he could attack FM. A big deal was made out of the claim that FM broadcasting needed to be moved higher in the VHF range to eliminate interference caused by sporadic e-skip. Sarnoff, of course, wanted these frequencies for TV. He never explained, and no one seemed to ask, how TV would not be affected. In fact, TV, with its amplitude-modulated video signal, would be more susceptible to e-skip than FM with its capture effect. RCA, however, had the power, the money, and the influence, and Major Armstrong found he was no match for the corporate giant. On January 15, 1945, the FCC issued a revised allocation proposal. Here it is. 25 to 28 megacycles, fixed, mobile, industrial, scientific, and medical. 28 to 30 megacycles, amateur 10 meter band. 30 to 44 megacycles, police, fire, and various government allocations. 44 to 50 megacycles, TV channel one. Now you know where it was. 50 to 54 was our amateur 6 meter band, 54 to 84 was TV channels 2 through 6, 84 to 102 was FM broadcasting, 102 to 108 was possible facsimile broadcasting, 108 to 132 was aircraft, 132 to 144 was government, 144 to 148 amateur 2 meter band, 148 to 152 was government. Note how 2 meters is sandwiched in between the two government bands. From 152 to 162 megacycles, police, fire, and other local government. 162 to 170 megacycles, government. 170 to 180 megacycles, navigational aids. 180 through 216 megacycles was TV channels 7 through 12. Note that TV only gets 12 VHF channels in this proposal. 216 to 220 is government, 220 to 225 is the amateur one and a quarter meter band, 
225 to 420 government including military aircraft 420 to 450 is the amateur 70 centimeter band 450 to 460 megacycles air navigation 460 to 470 megacycles a new citizens band which eventually would evolve into class a and class bcb and then into gmrs and then frs 470 to 480 megacycles was facsimile broadcasting and 480 to 940 megacycles was experimental TV for the CBS color wheel system. Yes, this proposal sounds a lot like what we have today, but the battle was only beginning. Major Armstrong was not giving up on an FM band in the 43 to 58 megacycle area. He didn't want the thousands of FM receivers and dozens of stations now on the air to suddenly become obsolete. CBS was still convinced that UHF was the place for TV and that their system was the best. During the first half of 1945, the battle would rage with many more proposals to come forth. Join us next time as the Ancient Amateur Archives continues to watch this epic battle. The ARRL November Sweepstakes Weekends loom large on the Amateur Radio Contest Horizon. The CW Weekend is November 6th through the 8th, while the Phone Weekend is November 20th through the 22nd. With more details on the upcoming sweepstake contest weekends, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Both events begin on Saturday at 2100 UTC and conclude on Monday at 0259 UTC. The SS offers operating categories for nearly every preference. The goal for many SS ops is to complete a clean sweep by contacting all 84 ARRL and Radio Amateurs of Canada or RAC sections. You're allowed to operate for 24 of the 30 available hours. Some sections are harder to work than others. Northern Territories, or NT in Canada, is always a challenge, and there's a slim chance that snagging NT could be easier this year. Jerry Hull, W1VE, also VE1RM, is hoping to operate as VY1AAA for both weekends, operating J. Allen's VY1JA Yukon Territory Station remotely from the U.S. Other difficult sections to contact include Delaware, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Pacific, and North Dakota. ARRL November sweepstakes, two weekends. Do not miss it. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Canada's Prince Edward Island province joined the list last year. Most sweepstakes operators try to run up the contact and multiplier counts and stay in the chair for the full 24 out of 30 allowable hours. The competition can be fierce and pileups can be huge. In 2020, ARRL received 1,445 logs for the CW event and 2,046 for the phone event. Now in his mid-70s, Alan essentially retired from ham radio a few years ago due to health issues, but he's bounced back this year with renewed enthusiasm and working to get a station and antennas ready for Hull to operate. At this point, he's sorting through a backyard scrap pile that includes tower sections he had up in the past. He wants to get 80 to 100 feet assembled and clamped to a sturdy utility pole, Hull says. Alan is committed to the task. VY1JA is now in reconstruction, Alan says on his QRZ.com profile. There is only a small chance that it will be done and on the air for sweepstakes CW this year. If so, signals may be weaker than in the past with only a 200 watt Omni 7 and a wire antenna. Plans for building an amp failed and antenna work has taken far longer than expected. Hull said if Allen does manage to erect an antenna support tower, VY1AAA will have inverted V antennas for 20 and 40 meters, which Hull considers the money bands from the Yukon on CW. So, hoping for good weather and good health for Jay, and then we might have VY1AAA on for the masses for sweepstakes CW, he said. Hull said if the CW weekend is successful, he'll consider also operating in the phone event. 
Alaska, Hawaii, and other U.S. territories in the ARRL's Pacific section, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands count as w ve stations, not as DX for the sweepstakes. Contesters, especially the less experienced, often want to know how to handle duplicate contacts. It's almost a given that this will happen in sweepstakes. While some operators still set up a hot key to send WKDB4 on CW when encountering a dupe, current best practice is to work the apparent dupe, log it, and then move on. While dupes don't earn any points, they also don't mean you'll incur an NIL, not in log penalty, if the apparent dupe did not log with the initial contact for one reason or another. The sweepstakes exchange is patterned on traffic handling terminology. For both CW and phone events, stations exchange a sequential serial number. No leading zeros are required. An operating category or precedence, call sign, the last two digits of the year first licensed, or check, and ARRL or RAC section. Most areas of the U.S. change from daylight savings time to standard time at 2 a.m. local time on November 7th by moving clocks back one hour. UTC is not affected. Logs are due within seven days after the event is over. Certificates will be awarded in the top operator CW and phone scores in each category in each ARRL and RAC section and division and plaques will be awarded to the overall and division winners. ICOM America is the principal award sponsor. An operating guide that relates some of the history and evolution of these North American contests is available under operating guidelines on the AWRL November sweepstakes page. Two recent amateur radio digital communications, or ARDC grants, will benefit the ARRL-affiliated Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club K6TZ and Oregon Ham Wan. Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, has more in this report filed from ARRL headquarters. A $35,550 grant will enable the Santa Barbara Club to construct an amateur radio station at the new Crisman, California Island Center in Carpinteria, California, at the invitation of Santa Cruz Island Foundation. The station is scheduled to open in 2022. SBARC promotes education and training programs for anyone interested in ham radio. Oregon Ham One, that's H A M capital W A N, like Wide Area Network, has received an ARDC grant of $88,000 to expand its digital communications network. The project aims to enhance amateur radio digital and emergency communications capabilities between Portland and Salem, Oregon. The nonprofit plans to expand its digital communications network by deploying 12 network backbone distribution sites between the two cities. Eventually, the sites will connect to the Puget Sound data ring, which currently extends from Seattle to Vancouver, Washington. The network would allow emergency management personnel to communicate in the event of a disaster, such as a major earthquake, that might disrupt telecommunications systems. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. The Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club promotes education and training programs and also encourages and sponsors experiments in electronics and promotes the highest standards of practice and ethics in the conduct of communications. The station will be prominently located near the Crisman, California Islands Center main entrance. An interactive display will provide an overview of amateur radio communications and the role that amateur radio has played in the history of the islands. When the station is not staffed, visitors can interact with it using a custom touchscreen that controls an interactive presentation on amateur radio and wireless technologies and their importance to mariners, aviators, scientists, and explorers who visit the rugged islands off the California coast. Webcams connected to the station via the Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club's microwave data network will offer visitors a view of the island's terrain in real time. The Santa Barbara Amateur Radio Club already maintains open repeaters, data systems, and a club station in Santa Barbara County under the K6TZ callsign. 
During an emergency, the Oregon Ham Wide Area Network will allow amateur radio operators to quickly set up network nodes where they are needed to provide emergency communication via the Oregon Ham WAN Digital Network. This will be a game changer for emergency communications in the Portland area, said Herb Wiener, AA7HW, the Oregon Ham WAN Project Leader. Deciding to fund the Oregon Ham WAN Project was an easy decision, said ARDC Grants Advisory Committee Chair John Hayes, K7VE. It is a well-organized and well-staffed project that uses multiple amateur radio technologies, such as the 44-net IP address space, 5 gigahertz radios, and proven software methodologies. It will provide a strong backbone network in Oregon and help preserve our microwave bands. Amateur Radio Digital Communications is a California-based private foundation that supports innovative amateur radio projects. The foundation makes grants for projects and organizations that follow amateur radio's practice and tradition of technical experimentation in both amateur radio and digital communications science. Time now for the AMSAT report. The AMSAT Annual Space Symposium and General Meeting is October 30th, and it's a virtual event just as it was last year. All are welcome. Go to www.amsat.org and click on the events link and then 2020 Annual Space Symposium to find the link to the conference, which appears in the articles. So you got to dig a little bit. Everything begins at 9 a.m. on Saturday, October 30th. At 9.15 are general presentations. At 2 p.m. is the AMSAT Education and CubeSat Simulator presentation. At 3 p.m. is the AMSAT Engineering presentation. The AMSAT Annual General Meeting at 4 p.m. wraps things up. The AMSAT Report comes to us each week courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. It's time for this week's Propagation Forecast Report. This week authored by Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington. Tad reports that solar activity declined last week and on Sunday, October 17th, there were no sunspots at all. Most days had the minimum non-zero sunspot number, which is 11, indicating a single sunspot group containing a single sunspot. The average daily sunspot number declined from 23.7 to 11.3, and the average daily solar flux dropped 7 points from 85.6 to 78.6. Geomagnetic indicators were quiet, with the average planetary A and dice declining from 12.4 to 8.4, the average middle latitude A index went from 10.9 to 5.4. No middle latitude A index was available for October 16th through the 18th, so middle latitude A index figures presented in this report are uneducated guesses on his part. Despite the lower activity, Tad noticed frequent 10 and 12 meter openings at his location in Seattle via FT8. So the predicted solar flux as we look ahead appears lower too, with values at 84 on October 24th and 25th, 85 on October 26th to the 29th, 88 on October 30th, and 85 on October 31st to November 11th. Looking at the predicted planetary A index, it is 5 on October 23rd through November 1st, 8 on November 2nd, 5 on November 3rd through the 5th, 12, 10, and 8 on November 6th through the 8th, and 5 on November 19th through the 13th. For more information concerning radio propagation, you can visit the ARRL Technical Information Service on the web and read an article called What the Numbers Mean. And you can also check out the propagation page by Carl Lusselswab, K9LA. 20 years ago, two huge coronal mass ejections hit Earth's magnetic field. The rapid double blow sparked a severe geomagnetic storm, with auroras so bright that they were visible in some American states even before nightfall. Power grids, satellite networks and the internet all survived the event, which lasted for more than 36 hours. Spaceweather.com has a report on the incident, which says that in 2001, Solar Cycle 23 was peaking and solar activity was very high. Strong flares were a daily occurrence. 
On October the 19th, giant sunspot number AR9661 erupted twice in quick succession, producing almost identical X1.6 class solar flares. The double blast hurled two bright coronal mass ejections towards Earth. The first CME took only two days to reach the Earth. It was fast and potent and ignited a severe geomagnetic storm. The KP interplanetary index reached 8. That's pretty rare, bearing in mind that level 5 already denotes a geomagnetic storm. The storm kept going for more than 15 hours. Observers in North Carolina in America said that auroras were visible in twilight even before the evening sky went fully black. Less than a day later, the second coronal mass ejection arrived, and it happened all over again. Another 15 hours of strong to severe storming ensued. Red auroras were sighted in Germany, France, Italy, Spain, Australia, Japan, and in the United States. Observers are hoping for something similar from the current Solar Cycle 25. Foundations of Amateur Radio For an activity that's seeped in the art of communication, Amateur Radio is a diverse collection of people, joined by a common interest and kept together using imperfect language describing an intrinsically complex science in the hope that we can learn from each other to get on air and make noise. In this cooperative endeavour, language is important. Let me start with a limerick by Arthur Frackenpole. There was a young fellow of Perth, who was born on the day of his birth. He married, they say, on his wife's wedding day, and died when he quitted the earth. Stay with me. In this day and age, first and foremost, let me give you a short summary, cobbled together from bits and pieces, of a new invention conceived whilst watching the evening sunset in close proximity to the beach. What this cornucopia of tautologies has to do with our hobby might not be obvious, but let me illustrate. Consider the phrase, a compromise antenna, as in, Oh, I'd never used that antenna, it's a compromise antenna. If you've been in this community for any time at all, you'll have heard that phrase, and unless someone pointed it out, you might not have realised that it's essentially unhelpful. Why? Because, as I've said many times before, all antennas are a compromise, by definition. This is true at several levels. At a fundamental level, an isotropic antenna is a theoretical antenna that radiates equally in all directions, horizontally and vertically, with the same intensity. It's infinitely small and operates on all frequencies with infinite bandwidth. It should be obvious, but this antenna cannot physically exist, so every built antenna represents a collection of trade-offs or compromises, and no antenna can radiate more total power than an isotropic antenna. Beyond that, Within the physical constraints of antenna building, there are many more compromises. Now this might not be immediately obvious, so let me elaborate. Consider a 28 MHz 7 element Yagi antenna. With a 12 meter boom, a 5.3 meter reflector element, a turning circle of 7.5 meters and weighing in at 53 kilo. At 20 meters above the ground it has a gain of 17.5 dBi and handles 1.5 kilowatt. It's physically capable of withstanding 180 km an hour winds. It's a lovely piece of kit, and if you have the space, it's absolutely something you might want to receive for your birthday and bolt to a mast somewhere near your radio. If all antennas are a compromise, you might ask yourself, how is this beautiful 10 meter Yagi a compromise? For starters, its total radiated power is less than an isotropic antenna. It works between 28 and 29 MHz, but nowhere else. It radiates signals really well in one direction, but not in any other. It requires lots of open space, and as a fixed installation it must be on a heavy-duty rotator clamped to a tall mast. To actually acquire and install requires more funds than I've spent on all my radios to date. Some of what I've mentioned might be acceptable to you, some not. For example, if you're always portable, this antenna makes no sense. You make choices to select an antenna that's best suited to the job, and in doing so, you are introducing compromises. Additionally, there are amateurs who would have you believe that a compromise antenna is one with high loss. High loss in comparison to what? If you live in an apartment block, there's no way that you can fit that 10 meter Yagi inside your bedroom. So, you compromise and use a magnetic loop antenna instead. 
If you're on top of a mountain, there's no opportunity to erect a structure, so you use a self-supporting vertical. If you're in a car, you cannot erect a horizontal dipole and drive down the highway, so you bolt a whip to your jalopy. All of the choices you make to fit a purpose, an environment, a budget and available material will combine into an antenna that hopefully gets you on air making noise. When someone tells you that an antenna is a compromise antenna, what they're really saying is that you made compromises that they are unwilling to make. That's easy to say if you have infinite space, money, experience and opportunity. In other words, they're just blowing hot air. The whole point of antenna building is to find a particular set of compromises that suits your situation at the time that you're doing it. The intent of this hobby is to learn what the impact of a particular choice is and how it affects the operation of an antenna in a specific situation. Next time you hear the redundant phrase, that's a compromise antenna, ask what compromises they're describing that they don't accept and decide for yourself if they're compatible with what you're attempting to achieve within the resources available to you. I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. This is the Rain Report, the weekly ham radio audio production of the Radio Amateur Information Network. Rain's founder producer, Hap Holly, KC9RP, considers this week's Rain Rerun from 1990 a real gem. It's one of those very rare talks Hap recorded on site at a radio club. Here's My Early Days as a Ham by former Chicago and current LA broadcaster Dick Helton, W9CTY. Helton was introduced by Reese Black, K9TOL. The speaker that we have this evening is Dick Helton. Afternoon news anchor for WBBM News Radio 78 has been fascinated by radio since childhood and broke into broadcasting in the 60s while studying journalism at the University of Illinois. These days at WBBM News Radio, Helton is known as a versatile professional journalist with an adversity to controversy. His weekday interviews explore subjects ranging from politics to entertainment, and he regularly hosts three of the station's most provocative call-in programs, Ask the Governor, Ask the Mayor, and Talk to the Schools. There's much more here. It tells you all about all his amateur radio, but I'm not going to let you. He sit there, fall asleep on me, and be asleep when he comes up to talk. Mr. Helton. Thank you. I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to come here and to meet with all of you tonight. And when Dave Alpert um, called me a um, few, well, in fact, now several weeks ago, asking if I would come and talk to you all tonight, I said, gee, that's terrific. I'd be very happy to do so if it would work into the schedule. And as it turns out, it did. Uh, it's rare, being someone on the radio such as myself, that I, I get an opportunity to actually see the audience. So it's kind of nice for me to be able to do that. When I walked in tonight, Mike Wolf over here, who is apparently uh, quite a listener of WBBM, walked up and he said, gee, you don't look a thing like you sound. <laughs> and, and of course, I said I never did. But it, it, it reminds me a little bit of the fact that those of us who are in radio, whether it's in ham radio or if we're in professional radio or whatever, uh, to some extent, we aren't maybe who other people think we are. It's one of the great joys of ham radio, I think, is the fact that you can really sort of be anonymous to that other person. You can open up your personality, uh, you can enjoy who you are, you can enjoy the other people that you're talking with, and yet there's a little shield. Now, the real truth of the matter, of course, comes out when you have meetings like this and when you become involved in clubs. And then you get the opportunity to see this person that you maybe have talked with for quite a period of time. And that person doesn't look anything like you expected. But that's the joy of it, because you know that person, you know that personality, and you know perhaps a great deal more about that individual than, uh, than you might have known had you met on a face-on-face -face basis to begin with. I, I told Dave that I would talk a little bit about ham radio and professional broadcasting and how this all sort of came together for me. And to some extent, my career in broadcasting is a little bit like the old uh, uh, Ted Baxter role on the old Mary Tyler Moore show. It all started at a little 250-watt radio station. Uh, in my case, it, it really began in the basement of our family home down in a little town called Brockton, Illinois, which is about 200 miles south of here, population 300. I uh, graduated in a high school class that had 16 kids in it, as a matter of fact. Uh, but my dad uh, had a great 
joy for listening to shortwave. And when I was a little kid, about six years of old, six years of age, I'd go down into the basement of our home, and he had a Hallicrafters S40B. Now, some of you here will remember an S40B. In fact, some of you here will remember the name Hallicrafters. Uh, <laughs> be that as it may, that, that little radio opened up for me a wonderful world of, of things that went far beyond my little town of Brockton. I could listen to the radio shows that were available through the, the networks and uh, the various broadcasts that came out of Chicago and New York and, and other places. But also, I had a chance to listen to people who were in faraway places. And for a kid that was basically a farm kid in a small town in East Central Illinois, that to me was fascinating. And it made me want to know more about who these people were. And we'd tune in to the hams. And we'd listen to them. Of course, it was all AM back then. But we'd listen to these conversations going on between people in New York and Los Angeles or, or somebody maybe uh, in, in, uh, in New York talking to someone in Europe someplace. And I thought, what a terrific thing this is. I mean, here you have this opportunity to talk to somebody far away and, and to get to know that person on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Well, as it turns out, over a long period of time, I became involved with other things, and my dad had the farming operation going. And uh, when you're farmers, you don't have a lot of time maybe to devote your attention to some of the other things that you would like. But when I was a sophomore in high school, my dad, who had always wanted to get that ham license for himself but had never found the time to do it, uh, came up to me and he said, Dick, I'll, I'll make you a proposition. He said, if you study for and you get a ham license, he says, I'll help you build a pretty good ham radio station. Well, I said, okay. I mean, after all, when you're a kid on a farm and the next house is a mile away and it's the dead of winter, you don't have a whole lot to occupy your time. So I checked around a little bit and I found a fellow in a town about 15 miles from me who was a ham. His name was Dick England. His call was K9HQF. And I called him up one night and I introduced myself and I said, I want to become a ham radio operator. Dick said, hey, come on down. I'll teach you everything you need to know. Now, I should tell you a little bit about Dick. Dick was the janitor at the high school in this other little town. He was in his 30s. He was raising a couple of kids on his own. Probably had more things going on in his life just to try to make ends meet on a day-to-day -day basis than, than most people that I knew. And yet there was no hesitation whatsoever. He said, come on, I'll teach you. And so in the winter, of 1960 into 1961, I spent a lot of time at Dick's house. I'd drive down a couple of nights a week to his home in the winter, slippery roads, ice, snow. My mother wondered if this, in fact, was all worthwhile for her kid to be out there on the highways uh, having his life threatened uh, with the, the bad weather. But I assured her that it was. Dick was the kind of guy that when I walked into his home and I met him, I knew that this was the hobby for me. I wanted to be like him. I wanted to have the kind of, of warmth that he had to bring me into that fold. I have to tell you a little bit about his radio station. Dick always said he was broadcasting from the th throne room. In fact, he was. <laughs> Dick's station was in the second floor bathroom of his house. And I learned the code and the theory sitting on the only other available seat in that room. <laughs> I may be unique in all the world of having learned the code and, and the theory sitting on the john, but I did. Finally, it came to that point where he said, I think you're ready. So he called another fellow in another town and said, I've got a kid over here. He's in high school and I've been teaching him the code and the theory and I think he's ready and I want you to give him the exam. Now back then, as far away as I lived from Chicago, I qualified for what was then the conditional exam. Voluntary exams then were the exception, frankly, not the rule. But we went over to this guy's house one night, and there I sat. I mean, this was the moment of truth. And we've all been confronted with that. Your mind turns to mush. <laughs> Your hand is just about as effective as mush on the key. And you think, what am I doing here? 
but for some strange, unbelievable reason, I passed this test. And about six weeks later came that little envelope, the little glass window from the FCC, and there I was, W9CTY, conditional license. Never forget it. 16th day of June, 1961. Now, in the middle of June, on a farm, there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, you're out getting weeds out of the beans and trying to do the corn and whatever. My dad said, we've got to go to Indianapolis. We've got to buy some radios. Because he was just as thrilled over this as I was. And so we dropped everything we were doing, and we hopped in the car, took the hired man with us, and drove to Indianapolis about 100 miles away, and we came home with an HT-37, a Drake 2B receiver, a bunch of copper weld wire, sack full of insulators, a JT-30 mic, and Dick came up and we began to assemble a ham radio station in my bedroom. And we worked on that for a couple of days, didn't manage to burn anything up, popped a couple of fuses, and we got on the air. And I can tell you, as everybody in this room who's a ham radio operator, the thrill of the first contact from my radio station in my bedroom going out to somebody else was unbelievable. The man's name was Shorty. His call was W9IBI. He lived in Mattoon, Illinois, just about 30 miles away. <laughs> but it could have been Siberia, for all I knew because it was the most dramatic, wonderful thing that I could imagine. And of course, as you can imagine, the rest of that summer was, I mean, ham radio around the clock. And, you know, finally got to the point where I, I can remember my parents beating on, the, on, the, on the, the wall between my bedroom and theirs at about 2 o'clock in the morning saying, sh my dad used to say, shut that not darn thing off. But he finally got to the point where he grew a little bit tired of ham radio himself. But it was terrific, and it was a proud moment for me. But a prouder moment came for me a few years later when I was in college at the University of Illinois in Champaign. And our home was about 40 miles from Champaign. And I had all this ham radio gear sitting in my bedroom down on the farm, nobody using it. So I called my dad one day from my dorm room and I said, Dad, I said, here's what we're going to do. I'll give up my college weekends and I'll come home. I'm going to teach you the theory and the code. I want you to get a license. Well, at that time, my dad was about um, 44 years old. I mean, then it seemed old. Today, it's nothing. <laughs> But I said, I'll do this, and he said, let's try it. And so I, I drove home every weekend, and I taught him theory, and I taught him code, and within six months, he had his license. After all those years of having wanted to do that, he had his license. And boy, you talk about starting to build a radio station, we did then. <laughs> because we had a lot of room, and we had a lot of places for wire and towers and things like that. And by the time we got all done with it, and some of you who are older in this group will recall some of this gear, uh, we finally had a complete Collins station, including a KWM2A, and a 51S1, a 30S1 amplifier, and we also had a Telrex Christmas tree for 2015 and 10 on top of a 200-foot tower. I mean, we played radio in a big way. Now, for me, this was, you know, this was the avenue to DX contest, so I became a, just a, a, an inveterate DXer. You know, on 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, boy, I was out there. My dad enjoyed rag chewing, and he just developed a terrific amount of number of friends all over the United States, and people that he'd go and visit with, and people who'd come and see us. And I've got a few awards sitting on my walls at home now from some DX contests from CQ and the AWRL, things that I'm very proud of. But the most proud thing, of course, is the, is the ham radio license of my dad. My dad only lived seven years after he got his license. He died very young at the age of 51. But those, I think, were seven of the most wonderful years of his life, and, and it meant a great deal to me to be able to provide that for him. I should tell you, and as you all know, ham radio is a pretty good way to get in trouble, especially for a kid. When I was a senior in high school, a couple of my good buddies were hams that lived in a little town about another 10 miles from us. And one of the fellows, whose name was Ron, his dad ran the local funeral home, and they lived in the house next door. And Ron and another pal, Gene, and I would spend weekends. And, you know, we were really the nerds and the geeks of our community. <laughs> I mean, you know, we were the guys that played with the radios and strung wire, you know, and could draw diagrams and circuits and things like that. And everybody else is playing basketball, you know, and, uh, and doing all sorts, all manner of uh, evil things on weekends. At least our mothers told us that's what they were doing. But Ron and Gene and I, we were pretty good at radio. 
And so I'll never forget, it was on a, it was a Sunday afternoon in the middle of summer. And we were working on Ron's rig, and it was an AM rig, and we're trying to get just a little more out of those finals, just tweak it just a little bit more. And we were getting some pretty good results. Well, unbeknownst to us, there was a funeral going on next door. And as I'm told, I was later told, the preacher had about 100 people in the room, and he was saying something like, you know, I'm sure if Harold could be here with us today, he'd be saying to us, hello, hello, test. Hello, 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 test. Hello, CQ75, hello. Apparently the funeral home PA was a damn good receiver. And uh, needless to say, we never played ham radio on uh, funeral days uh, anymore after that. We did take the, um, after I got married and came to Chicago, actually I got married after I came to Chicago and started working for WBB on radio. I married a um, beautiful young woman who uh, was a flight attendant for American Airlines. As a matter of fact, this year we'll celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. She was pretty excited about ham radio too. I mean, she enjoyed this hobby. And I thought she was so excited about it that I had no compunction on our honeymoon of taking the KWM2 along with us. <coughs> Principally because we were going to the South Pacific. We honeymooned in Australia and New Zealand and wound up in Tahiti. Uh, and I got licenses in all three places to, uh, to operate from. And uh, Janice in later years has, uh, has often uh, told some of her friends that on her honeymoon she spent more time saying da 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 instead of ooh ah ooh ah. But uh, that's not true. Uh, although I must tell you that DXing from Tahiti is, uh, is, is quite a lot of fun. Later adventures took us to India. Uh, where we tried to get the KWM-2 through customs at the New Delhi airport uh, about a week and a half before India went to war with Pakistan. You can imagine the customs inspector's eyes when he opened up that suitcase and there was this big radio inside with all sorts of wires and cables and things like that. And I knew we were in trouble when he said, well, <clears throat> let me get my supervisor. And the supervisor came over and he said, let me get somebody from the army. And we spent three days going through the Indian bureaucracy trying to get the KWM-2 out of quarantine so that we could actually use it, which we later did. And then took it on to Nepal, uh, up in the Himalayas to Kathmandu, uh, where uh, I have the pleasure of having amateur radio license number four. Uh, this beautifully typed out ham radio license that I have the call sign 9NCTY. Now, for those of you who are DXers, you know that the, the real prefix is 9N1. Uh, I'm sure many of you know 9N1MM, uh, Father Moran over there, who's a terrific fellow, and I'll tell you more about him later. But anyway, I could not convince this man at the Telecommunications Bureau who was typing out this license that it was 9N1CTY. No, 9NCTY, because apparently that's the way it looked on the back of airplanes. So that's what I wound up with. <coughs> and I spent more time explaining the call sign to people that I was talking to than, uh, than actually making contacts, but it was a lot of fun. Let me tell you a little bit about Father Moran, because as I saw a lot of nods in here and smiles when I mentioned his name. This is a terrific fellow. Perhaps some of you have had a chance to meet him on a one-on-one -on -one basis, because he spent some time back here in Chicago. That's where his family is. Janice and I had gone there the first time, and we were staying in this hotel called the Hotel Annapurna. And he came over to meet us for the first time, drove his little VW bug over, and he came into our room, and he looked at the two of us, and he realized, I mean, we didn't have to say anything. He realized we hadn't really been eating real well. I mean, you can only take so much curry over a period of, of a few days. And he said, you people need some food. And I said, I think you're right. And within a moment, we were in his Volkswagen, going through a gate, knocking on a door at the American ambassador's residence. And she opened up the door and she said, Father Moran, come in with your friends. And within a matter of minutes, we were eating Vermont ham and Wisconsin cheese and California wine and just having a terrific time. And this is the kind of man this is. So if you have a chance to talk with him and you hear his call on the air, take that opportunity to speak with him. We spent other times in, uh, in Ecuador and in Thailand and Hong Kong and, and, and many, many other places. And I can assure you that, that doing that and meeting ham radio operators from around the world uh, on that one-on-one -on -one basis is, is just a terrific opportunity. It's, it's really something that, uh, that brings the spirit of what this hobby is home to you. At, at WBBM, having been a ham radio operator has been very useful to me because, first of all, it has made me a friend with the technicians. And if you're a pal with the techs, you're in. You want to be their friend because if you're not their friend, they can make life miserable for you. Not that anybody at WBBM would ever do that, but the point is that it's good to be their friend. And, and I know enough technically that I occasionally help them with the gear and stuff like that or make suggestions about
perhaps things we can do to improve. Uh, I did floor one technician one time one evening when I was on the air, and he was on the other side of the window running the uh, pots and, and the knobs and the dials and making sure that the transmitter was up and running okay. And it was 10.30, and it was time to do the station ID, and I said, you're listening to CBS in Chicago, W9CTY. <laughs> And I looked up, and he wasn't there anymore. <laughs> he, was, he was on the floor. <laughs> but I did get some QSL cards. <laughs> so for, for a time, I, I think I was perhaps the most powerful ham radio station in the world. I, I haven't done that since. I have, on the other hand, uh, had occasions where I've been on, on the ham radio talking with people and have them recognize me. Uh, the occasion occurred when I was talking to a fellow in San Francisco, and he said, boy, your voice sounds familiar. And he finally put one and one together and, and came up with who I was. And as it turns out, this fellow was a pilot for United Airlines and flew into Chicago. And United, occasionally when they fly into the city on one of their uh, audio channels, puts up our radio station so people can listen to the news. And so he had heard me in that case. And on another occasion, I was talking to a fellow out in the state of Kansas who was a Kansas State trooper and said that uh, he recognized my voice and said that he, this was back when I was working at night, and he used to listen to our station as he was making his patrols up and down the state of Kansas uh, late at night. So that has been part of the added enjoyment as well. And you know, in, in one way or another, we all owe our involvement in this hobby really to somebody else. Somebody who was either willing to kind of take us under our wing and to teach us the code and to teach us the theory, maybe it's somebody you called up on the phone, or perhaps it was that, that strange person next door that had these weird antennas in the backyard, and who everybody else suspected as being something more or perhaps less uh, than what they really were. And, and now we all know what it's like to be like that. Uh, and who maybe made funny little squiggly lines on your TV set from time to time. But the point was, and is, and does remain, that there are people who want to help. Uh, in my case, uh, the person that really wanted to help was my dad, uh, who had that mysterious little radio down in his basement and had those strange little meters, little green meters and little green windows with funny numbers that I didn't really fully comprehend or understand. But I'll tell you what they are. Those are windows that enrich our lives. Thank you. This has been a talk by Dick Helton, W9CTY, afternoon anchor on Chicago's WBBM News Radio 78. This presentation about his earlier days in ham radio was given before the North Shore Radio Club, Highland Park, Illinois. I'm Hap Holly, KC9 RP in Chicago. At first, it seemed to be a bit of a reach, launching planning for an event two years in the future. But as Ohio Homeland Security emergency management planners explain, the predicted solar eclipse promises to bring hundreds of thousands of people into many Ohio counties. And Ohio agencies such as responders, hospital and medical providers, highway crews and tourist organizations will need to be prepared for the onslaught. Mass care, communication, possible shelters and many other aspects have to be carefully provisioned. And complicating this, the date for the eclipse is April 8th, in Ohio weather, being what it is at that time of the year, spectators could be in conditions ranging from 2 feet of snow to 80 degrees of temperature. Included in the planning was Ohio Amateur Radio, bringing the Amateur Radio Emergency Service in on the ground floor, led by Ohio EMA planner Colin Campbell. Several hundred agency representatives are divided into service areas, including communication and emergency medical care. Those two subgroups include Amateur Radio with Aries Ohio Section Emergency Coordinator Stan Broadway and 8BHL to provide input on the capabilities and services available through ham radio operators. Planning is underway and will continue right up until the actual event takes place. The eclipse will place nine Ohio counties exactly in the line of totality with complete darkness. 35 more counties will watch it as a full eclipse. Many more of Ohio's 88 counties will see a partial eclipse. There are over 1,000 Aries members in Ohio, and this event will probably involve many of them. All this hands effort will provide communications and messaging to served agencies.
The International Amateur Radio Union reports that its Region 1 Youth Working Group, Team Yota, established a monthly online series called Yota Online during the COVID pandemic. In one of its episodes, the main topic covered was the Jamboree on the Air and Jamboree on the Internet Scout event. Marcus Klapdor of the World Organization of the Scout Movement was a guest on the One Hour Live show. The youth team were invited to join the German Jota and Jyoti headquarters during the worldwide event held between the 15th and the 17th of October 2021. The team prepared an amateur radio setup for HF and satellite QO100 operations, and with the help of fellow hams, they were able to put together and operate the station Delta Lima Zero Juliet Oscar Tango Alpha. This special call sign was put on the air from Castle Rieneck near Frankfurt in Germany. 20 scouts from all over Germany joined the event, as well as some international scout representatives. Members of the youth team, Claudia, Delta Charlie 2, Charlie Lima, Philip, Delta Kilo 6, Sierra Papa, and Marcus, Delta Lima 8, Golf Mike, were very happy to introduce the world of amateur radio and its youth working within IARU Region 1. Good questions were asked by all those attending. There was an opportunity for talks with the chairperson of the European Scout Committee, Lars Kram, amongst others. The Youth Working Group will keep up contacts with the Scout Committee with a view to working together on future events. The Jamboree on the Air programme includes activities such as operating an HF radio or communicating via the geostationary amateur satellite QO100 using either single sideband speech or digital modes. Interestingly, the best response from the attending scouts was to the presentation about Morse code. The youth team were very impressed with what these young talented scouts already knew and they asked many detailed questions. There were also pre-arranged on-air contacts with other worldwide scout groups in countries such as Luxembourg, the Netherlands and England. The team also ran a small amateur radio direction finding fox hunt to show off the diversity of the amateur radio hobby. The organisers of the Scout get-together took care of the Jamboree on the internet part of the event themselves. They programmed little microbit computers, chatted with worldwide Scouts, or printed 3D models of antennas. In summary, it can be said that the cooperation was a complete success. This was confirmed from the very first personal meeting of those involved in the project, and is to be continued and steadily expanded on in the future. You can find out more about the IARU Region 1 Youth Team by visiting iaru-r1.org. A team of 135 ham radio operators from the four-state region supported medical teams volunteering for the Bank of America Chicago Marathon on October 10, 2021. The Chicago Marathon is the third largest marathon in the world. With more on this extreme event, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who has the story on how amateurs provided the marathon with more than just communications. This marked the 13th year that amateur radio volunteers have partnered with the marathon medical team to help coordinate responses, arrange for deployment of medical supplies, and provide situational awareness for the organizers. The largely flat marathon course has 20 aid stations on its 26.2 mile course, each with a medical tent. Hams are deployed at each medical tent to support communication for the medical teams. In addition to passing urgent medical and health and welfare traffic, ham radio volunteers also provide situational awareness for race organizers, for example, updating the number of individuals under care at each medical tent. Most communication is done via FM repeaters. If a runner develops a problem, spotters alert a rapid response medical team, each with a ham volunteer to handle communication. Even in an era of nearly ubiquitous cell phones, ham radio remains able to provide an independent resource that can back up all other communication. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. This was also one of the largest events Chicago has hosted since the pandemic shut the city and the marathon down in 2020. Ham teams are often built around veteran operators, but this year many newly minted hams applied, most of whom have had little or no public service experience. The ham team leaders offered several Zoom training classes before the event to get everyone acquainted with the event and their respective roles. There are two main communication nets, a medical net and a logistics net. 
To support those nets, the hams use nine repeaters. Most of the repeaters with course-wide footprints belong to local clubs, but hams also deploy five special-use temporary repeaters. They also have several backup strategies in case of complications. For instance, this year, they had to abandon one key logistics repeater because of RFI noise that was not experienced previously, and so the entire team moved quickly to another repeater channel. They report the number of patients being cared for at each course medical tent and the stress level the medical teams face in providing care. Stress is a subjective value, but does communicate to the medical director if a situation is growing more complex. Higher stress levels can be the result of an unusually high number of patients, reduced supplies, or a sudden increase of serious medical cases. At each course medical tent, the hams are also responsible for changing the event alert flag. This is an innovation that was introduced after the near-disastrous 2007 marathon where the high heat and humidity forced the race to stop. That became a very complicated problem because runners didn't want to stop running and the organizers did not have systems in place to communicate to the field. The organizers came up with a visual way to show the runners what the course conditions were so runners could better adjust their pace. The EAS conditions are green, yellow, red, and black. This year's event started in yellow because of the unusual heat and changed to red because of the humidity and the increased potential for serious heat-related injuries. Generally, when a red flag is displayed, many runners adjust their pace and often start walking. This helps to cool them down and prevents many serious injuries. Following the 2007 event, the organizers reached out to the ham radio community to see how they might be able to help. Once a proper role was defined, it was agreed that hams would serve the medical director and provide health and welfare traffic. Doctors, they admitted, preferred to serve patients and would rather not be responsible for communications. They seemed happy to pass those tasks to a ham radio team. Most of the hams communicate using FM repeaters, largely because those repeaters are in place and many hams have that equipment. They have experimented with fusion and DMR radios. DMR is used with the teams on the final mile, where the teams of hams work with a team of medical personnel. Historically, the last mile has proven to be the most dangerous area for runners. The ham service communicators and call for additional medical support if such support is required. Ham teams also work in small tactical teams that roam the finish line area. If a runner collapses for any reason, spotter towers call out the person to the rapid response medical team to provide aid. Each medical team has a ham to handle communication. If the case needs to be escalated, the hams call into forward command to dispatch mobile professional medical teams to assist. In forward command, the hams have 10 people who serve as net controls, traffic handlers, logging specialists, and expediters. They work alongside the ambulance company and the resources of the entire city of Chicago. So if the medical director wants water to spray on the runners to help cool them off, the ham might need to communicate with the fire department to find out whether certain hydrants need to be opened. The event has plenty of personal challenges for the hams. Many report to their duty stations very early in the morning so they can do roll calls at 6 a.m., and many remain on course working until the event ends around 4 p.m. Rain or shine, snow or wind, the hams and the medical teams must adjust to the weather. Hams also serve the aid stations, co-located with each course medical tent, which can have as many as 300 volunteers handling water and gator aid. In the event of an emergency, hams shadow the aid station captain to facilitate communication back to forward command. All communication from the course medical tent to the forward command tent is handled with two mobile radios, one dedicated to medical traffic and the other for logistics. They in turn talk to the remaining members of their team using simplex frequencies. Three stations provide local wet bulb readings to the meteorologist sitting in forward command. 
He happens to be a ham as well and provides custom forecasts for the event. Hams are not the only communication link these days. Everyone has cell phones, and the race does have its own network of commercial radios, but those are used for race operations. Cell phones have proven to be unreliable when there are so many spectators lining the park and streets. Ham Radio provides an independent resource to the event organizers that can be a backup to all other communication. The hams also create a remote backup command post that the city command center can use in the case of an emergency where continuity of operations is required. Like hams who serve other large public events, the primary skill needed is the willingness to serve the event and its medical director. It demands a commitment to perform and execute at a high level. Hams today compete with many other services to be relevant. Staying focused on the customer and delivering quality service keeps us at the table. Chicago has been recognized for how well it integrates all of its resources, and the hams have been publicly recognized by FEMA observers for their performance. Ham radio is important, but it is just one small component of this very complex event that demands 20,000 volunteers to be successful. Ham radio has a unique role and it works right alongside the other specialty service groups. This year's Hammerland Radio Special Event is a busy one for members of the High Appalachian Mountain Amateur Radio Club. Special Event Station W4H is marking two occasions this year, the 160th anniversary of the birth in Sweden of Oscar Hammerland, founder of Hammerland Manufacturing, and the 70th anniversary of the radio factory he opened in Mars Hill, North Carolina, to produce Hammerland receivers and transmitters. Hammerland founded his company in New York City in 1910, and while it was operating there, it created the first commercial shortwave superheterodyne receiver. North Carolina, however, was home to Hammerland's last manufacturing plant, which closed in 1973. Even if your radio is a newer model, you can still contact operators between the 17th of November at 1100 UTC and 19th of November at 0100 UTC. But don't be surprised if the radio transmitting back at you is one of the older classic Hammerlands. Operators will be calling QRZ using CW, SSB, AM, FM, as well as FT8. Hams in the area can also make contact via the Mount Mitchell repeater on 145.190 MHz. The Latvian RSF team has started activity as 3 Delta Alpha Zero Whiskey Whiskey from Eswatini, formerly known as Swaziland, and will be on the air until October the 26th. Activity is on 160 to 10 meters using CW, single sideband, RITI, and FT8 in Fox and Hounds mode. The team has had some power outages during their stay. QSL is via Yankee Lima 2 Golf November directly, or Club Logs OQRS direct and via the Bureau. Their log will be uploaded to Logbook of the World six months after the end of the operation. On October the 16th, the team reported that their transmit antenna setup was finished. But that morning, what they have dubbed the infamous dog escaped his fencing and collapsed one of the spider beam antennas. It can be repaired. As the setup is almost finished, the team plans to be on the air much more. Local LED lighting has been kept switched off to reduce the band noise. The beverage antenna is not yet installed. A beverage is a very, very long but low-mounted antenna designed to maximize signal while minimizing local man-made noise. The team's first batch of 3,368 contacts has been uploaded to Club Log. The team is located in two different houses some distance apart from each other. One location has a spider beam for the 20 to 10 meter amateur bands, a vertical for the 80 meter band and another vertical for the 40 meter band. The second location also has a spider beam for the 20 to 10 meter bands, a DX commander vertical for the 40 meter to 10 meter bands, and an 18 meter tall spider pole based top loaded vertical for the 160 meter to 30 meter bands. Up to four transceivers are in use simultaneously. For more details and updates, go to lral.lv forward slash 3 Delta Alpha Zero Whiskey Whiskey. There are many photographs on this website, and there's also a list of the frequencies the team say they will tend to operate on.
Meanwhile, in a separate activation, also from the Kingdom of Eswatini, 3 Delta Alpha Zero Romeo Uniform is still active. This is a Russian de-expedition team, and they will continue to be active near Umbabane until October the 22nd. Activity will be on 160 to 6 metres using CW, single sideband, FT8 and QO100 satellite operation with multiple stations. The team's website at 3DeltaAlpha0.ru forward slash EN for the English version has a list of suggested operating frequencies and is being updated regularly with the latest operating information. As of October the 17th, 3 Delta Alpha Zero Romeo Uniform had made a total of 75,684 contacts with 21,000 unique call signs. Broken down by mode, this represented 34,987 Morse contacts, 8,248 single sideband voice contacts and 32,449 FT8 data mode contacts. Broken down by geographical location, by far the most number of contacts so far have been with Europe. QSL is via Romeo 7 Alpha Lima, direct or via the Bureau, Club Logs OQRS, which is their preference, or via Logbook of the World. The Hamsai Antarctic Eclipse Festival in December is seeking amateur radio participation. As the shadow of the moon passes across Antarctica on December 4th, it will generate traveling ionospheric disturbances that will, in turn, affect radio propagation. The unusual geometry of this year's eclipses will give researchers an opportunity to investigate complicated ionospheric dynamics over the poles as the long daytime of polar summer is briefly interrupted by the eclipse. During this and other Hamsai Eclipse Festivals, hams and citizen scientists are asked to collect Doppler shift data from time standard stations such as WWV. All that's needed is an HF radio connected to a computer. A GPS discipline oscillator is helpful for collecting data, but it's not required. Data collection will run from December 1st through December 10th, and the results will be made available for scientific analysis. The worldwide project, which is being called the Antarctic Eclipse Festival, will be looking for measurements gathered between the 1st and the 10th of December. Instructions on how to sign up for the festival, how to collect the data, and how to submit it can be found on the HAMSI website at hamsci.org. All radio amateurs and shortwave listeners are invited to join in, even those located far from the path of totality. In 2020, more than 100 individuals from 45 countries took part in Eclipse Festivals. The instructions are available in multiple languages. HAMSI is an initiative of ham radio operators and geospace scientists dedicated to advancing scientific research and understanding through amateur radio activities. Eclipse Festivals are pilot campaigns for the Personal Space Weather Station, HAMSI's flagship project. The Personal Space Weather Station team seeks to develop a global network of citizen science stations. Participants monitor the geospace environment to deepen scientific understanding and enhance the radio art. For more information on the Antarctic Eclipse Festival and how to participate, visit the HAMSI website at hamsci.org. AWRL's YouTube channel, ARRLH-Q, has launched a series of amateur radio technician class license courses. This series of videos features Dave Kassler, KE0OG, QST's Ask Dave columnist, who leads viewers through the AWRL ham radio license manual. These videos supplement the manual and provide an overview of the sections you'll be studying, along with a few videos on how things work. Share this excellent resource with those who are preparing to take their technician exam and visit the ARRLH-Q YouTube channel for more great amateur radio videos. If you are interested in a general class licensing course, the National Electronics Museum will be holding a free virtual general class course on Zoom beginning Thursday, October 28th through Thursday, January 13th, which will be nine sessions, plus three weeks off for the holidays in November and December. Sessions will start at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time and run for three hours. The National Electronics Museum has been holding these classes for years. If you are interested in signing up for this virtual general class course, please send an email to roland.enders at comcast.net. The ASME Foundation Board of Directors has announced that it will be giving a grant to the Sekiali's Amateur Radio Association to establish a facility for its recently formed Amateur Radio Club. The ASME Foundation also announced that Steve Babcock, 
VE6WZ of Calgary, Alberta, Canada, is the latest recipient of its Excellence Award. This honor is presented to individuals and groups who, through their own service, creativity, effort, and dedication, have made significant contributions to amateur radio. The ASME Foundation cited Babcock's contributions to the art of low-band antennas and remote operating. Babcock has made countless hours of instructional videos which are available to the amateur community for free via his QRZ.com profile. The Yasmi Excellence Award is given in form of a cash grant and an individually engraved crystal globe. Meanwhile, the November issue of QST includes the article The Beverage Antenna 100 Years Later by Ward Silver, N0AX, and Frank Donovan, W3LPL. The famous receiving antenna, designed and patented in 1921 by Harold Beveridge, W2BML, remains popular for the low bands as increasing sunspot activity in solar cycle 25 leads to weaker signals on 160 and 80 meters. The article explains the beverage antenna's noise rejection abilities as well as how to build a basic beverage antenna system. The November issue also includes a special contesting insert, Contest Season 2021-2022, which is full of resources and hints to help you have your best radio sport season yet. There are thousands of visitors to the National Radio Center of the Radio Society of Great Britain each month. So many that the Society is working to expand its volunteer team, especially for weekend shifts. The National Radio Center is located at the infamous Bletchley Park, a Victorian mansion near Milton Keynes, 75 kilometers or 50 miles northwest of London. It was the Center for Second World War Intelligence Message Code Breaking. National Radio Center volunteers will receive training and have access to the GB3RS radio station on the premises. They're being asked to be available to work at least two days a month, especially on weekends. If you are interested or have questions, please contact Martin Baker, G0GMB, at nrc.support at rsgb.org.uk, nrc.support at rsgb.org.uk. On October 14th, the Straight Key Century Club enrolled its 25,000th member as a part of the Florida Island Hoppers Amateur Radio Club. W4USI Club Trustee Bill Clark, W3SI, who has been an individual member for over a year, said he's excited to have his club joined by far the friendliest, most active group I've ever been with. Now, as they activate U.S. Islands, the club can also issue their membership number. The Straight Key Century Club was founded in 2006 to promote and preserve the art of manual sending with straight keys, bugs, and side swipers. Membership can quickly, quickly spread from North America to Europe, Oceania, and Asia. Members can earn various awards as well as participate in sprints and other contests. The club welcomes new and returning CW operators with an overriding philosophy of always being considered regarding the other operator's speed and skill. Membership in the Straight Key Century Club is free and open to operators of all skill levels. They provide a good place to get your CW feet wet, as well as a fun place to hone your skills on mechanical keys. For more information and to join, please visit their website at www.skccgroup.com. This is November 3, Victor Echo Mike with your month ending September 2021 Parks on the Air update. Be sure to visit parksontheair.com for more information about the program and pota.app for spotting, park information, leaderboards, and more. Low CQ, low CQ, CQ POTA, CQ Parks on the Air. And now in Parks on the Air news. In September, POTA welcomed Brazil and Norway to the program, which means we now have parks in 102 different DXCC entities. Activators in Brazil can now choose from over 700 different parks to activate, while activators in Norway, which is rich with nature reserves, have more than 2,500 parks to choose from. In POTA events, coming up on October 16th and 17th is the Autumn Support Your Parks event. This is a great opportunity to get out for a low-key weekend activity and make some contacts before the weather turns cold, 
or for our friends in the Southern Hemisphere as the seasons start to warm up. In our last item of POTA news, we're excited to announce that September of 2021 was an all-time record-setting month for POTA, with more than a quarter of a million contacts made in one month. Although logs are still coming in, the QSO count is currently at 263,478. And now for our monthly stats update. As we mentioned during our news item, September was the biggest month ever for Parks on the Air. During the month, there were over 250,000 contacts made by about 1,500 activators. These activators put nearly 3,500 parks on the air from 27 different DX entities. The top activators for the month were K4NYM with 3,378 QSOs and KU8T who activated 61 different parks. The top hunter for the month was KZ4KX with 1,270 QSOs while hunting 943 different parks. In our POTA DX corner, Japan was the most active entity outside of North America with 3,779 QSOs being made in September. Not to be outdone, however, we had quite a bit of activity from Canada, Alaska, Puerto Rico, England, Wales, France, and many other entities. The top DX activators outside of North America for the month were MW0GWG with 978 QSOs and JF7RJM who activated 30 parks. This concludes our September 2021 Parks on the Air update. As always, the team at Parks on the Air wishes you safe activations and happy hunting. 73. The District Administration in Kerala, a state on the tropical southwest coast of India, has sought the service of ham radio operators to coordinate disaster relief operations in case the official communication systems get cut off due to any rain-related incident. Recently, incessant rains and resultant flooding disrupted lives across central Kerala. Ham radio enthusiasts have quietly swung into action in Frisur district, setting up unique workstations to ensure a reliable stream of communication in case nature's fury wreaks havoc on conventional methods of contact. Communication turns out to be a major challenge when natural calamities strike. During heavy floods, there are chances that the power supply will be down for days, which will affect the communication systems, including mobile phone networks. C.S. Sarachandran, a former Merchant Navy officer turned ham radio operator, is one of 10 operators who have been engaged by the Thrissa administration to handle emergency communication in case of any untoward incidents. All the operators have the amateur station individual operator license issued by the union government. All the local administration offices in Thrissur district are now equipped with amateur radio facilities so that even when all other communication systems are down, emergency services can still be contacted and details can be shared. The skills and equipment of ham radio operators were utilised during the 2018 August deluge when the whole of Kerala state was ravaged. Due to severe flooding, power connections were lost in most parts. This affected official mobile communications in many places. Over 40 ham radio operators came to the aid of the district administration, working with them to help at least 2,000 people during the floods that year. Ham radio and its operations are considered as the king of all hobbies in India, and amateur radio, as it's otherwise known, is internationally accepted as a means of emergency communication. The full story can be read by searching the web for the Economic Times of India. And now, with his segment on tower climbing and antenna safety, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. I wanted to take some time to cover some of the common topics related to installing antenna systems on towers. First, let's examine designing and installing an antenna mount for the side of a smaller tower, like the one in your yard. I have built a few homemade mounts out of scrap pieces of steel, usually built from a three-quarter inch steel pipe about three feet long and three steel bars about one to two inches across, maybe a quarter inch thick. Material like this can often be purchased off the shelf from your local hardware store or welding shop. You will need to climb the tower to measure the sizes and dimensions of the tower, legs, and diagonal members where you intend to mount the sidearm you're building. If you do not have access to a welder, have the shop weld together the mount with the ends of the straps onto the pipe, with about a, a foot between the straps, which would be centered on the three-foot pipe. 
This will give you about a foot above and below the straps onto which you can side mount or end mount an antenna. Pre-drill the holes for U-bolts to mount the straps onto the tower legs. Then also do the same for the U-bolts at the furthest end of the straps from the mounting tube. This mount should be set across one entire face of the tower so it can be hinged inward during mounting or servicing. After the mount is set in place and the antenna is set on the mount, the third support strap can be clamped to the mount and tower to reduce wobble. This is not a suitable mount for a wide tower unless you intend to mount the antenna close to the tower. The most common rule for mounting distance is one half wavelength from the closest face of the tower. If done properly, would make the tower nearly electrically transparent to the incoming or outgoing signals. If you draw a sine wave on a piece of paper, you'll notice that the voltage at one half wavelength is zero. This is why we prefer to mount antennas at multiples of one half wavelength. At two meters, that equals one meter out, or 39 inches from the antenna to the closest face on the tower. Imagine the sidearm necessary for six meters. At 224 megahertz, it equals about 24 inches for a half wave distance. If you have done all your measurements accurately at the mounting site, you can assemble the entire structure on the ground and make sure it all fits before taking any of it into the air. Since my homemade mounts usually weigh less than 15 pounds, I usually carry them up the tower with me, set them in place, then bring up the antennas and feed lines. This plan would change depending upon the height of the tower, other antennas on the tower, or how you feel about carrying cargo up the side of the tower safely. Sometimes it's easy, other times there would be too much risk of touching other active antennas, which would make hoisting the mount and antenna by rope from the ground necessary. It is obvious here that pre-planning is essential to ensure safety and reduce the number of trips up and down the tower. While I have promoted the idea of wearing cargo up the tower, I'm the first to admit that limiting trips on the tower and hours on the tower are the real goal in any job I do. Limiting both man hours and movement will also limit the risk of death, which is cool. I've seen a few different methods of securing amateur size coax to a tower leg. The most common I've seen is regular plastic electrical tape. The biggest problem with electrical tape is its lifespan. Mother Nature works to remove the sticky from electrical tape within the first half year. I've also seen cable ties used. As far as I know, clear or white cable ties are not made to survive sunlight, ozone, or Mother Nature's worst, which limit these to about seven months or less, especially if they are flexed regularly. I think the black cable ties are the best for outdoor mounting. Lastly, I've seen 12 gauge solid wire with insulation cut to five inch lengths and wrapped around the tower leg and coax, then twisted. I know this type of scrap material to hold coax to a tower leg for decades with no visible sign of aging. I have also seen a black cable tie over several layers of electrical tape. And coax can change size and length during the day, so always allow for these changes. Remember, tower work at any height can easily become deadly. Money spent on books, videos, and climbing gear is well worth the investment. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Members of the Dashua Area Radio Society believe it's important to take the mystery out of amateur radio for licensees, whether they're new technicians or veterans with a general or extra class license. Along those lines, the club is planning an amateur radio boot camp. The camp is being held on Saturday, November 13th. This virtual online offers tutorials and demonstrations on everything from putting together an HF station and operating SSB to fox hunting, CW operation, programming a radio, joining a repeater net, and even the basics of Echolink. Sessions will be held from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The Radio Society website notes that the boot camp is for anyone in North America, not just amateurs in the New England states. Attendance is even open to prospective amateurs who want to learn more about what awaits them once they do get a license. To register or for more information, point your web browser to www.n1fd.org slash ham bootcamp.
Members of the United Nations Global Service Centre Amateur Radio Club are now active as 4 Uniform 24 Oscar Charlie Tango from Brindisi in Italy. Activity is to mark United Nations Day on October the 24th, which has been celebrated since 1948. The purpose of the UN Day event is to promote to people worldwide the principles of humanity, unity and world peace. Operations should be on 160 to 10 metres. Remember, this operation only counts for Italy for DXCC purposes. You can QSL via 9 Alpha 2 Alpha Alpha or Club Log. In the 125 years since Marconi made his first radio transmissions, the spectrum has been divvied up into ranges and bands, most of which are reserved for governments and large telecom companies. Amidst all of the corporate greed, the little guys managed to carve out their own small corner of the spectrum with the help of organizations like the American Radio Relay League. Since 1914, the ARRL has represented the interests of us amateur radio enthusiasts and helped to protect the band set aside for amateur use. To actually take advantage of the wonderful opportunity to transmit on these bands, you need a license issued by the FCC. The licenses really aren't hard to get, and you should get one. But what if you don't feel like taking a test, or if you're just too impatient? Well, fear not, because there's some space on the radio spectrum for you, too. Welcome to the wonderful world of legal, unlicensed radio experimentation, where anything goes. Okay, not anything, but the possibilities are wide open. There are a few experimental radio bands known as Lofer, Medfer, and Hyfer, where anyone is welcome to play around. And of the three, Lofer seems the most promising. Lofer, as the name would suggest, contains the lowest frequency range of the three, falling between 160 kilohertz and 190 kilohertz with a whopping wavelength of around one mile. Also known as the 1750 meter band, this frequency range is well suited for long transmission paths through ground wave propagation, a mode in which the radio signals move across the surface of the earth. This can easily carry even low power signals hundreds of miles, and occasionally through some atmospheric black magic, signals have been known to travel thousands of miles. These ground wave signals also travel well across bodies of water, especially salt water. For more information on Lofer and the other two available bands, see the full article on hackaday.com. And finally this week, Thad Wykall, KG5ATD, director of the Amateur Radio Club of Parker County, Texas, relates the following story he entitled, Can an Amateur Radio Handheld Stop a Train? Every year in the city of Weatherford in Parker County, Texas, the Peach Festival is held. As part of the festival, a bicycle ride, the Peach Pedal, is conducted, supported by the cooperative efforts of local amateur radio clubs and their volunteers. This year, the Tri-County Amateur Radio Club of Azel, Texas, performed the pre-event legwork and organized the net control operators, rest stop operators, and the support and gear vehicle operators. The Amateur Radio Club of Parker County and other clubs members were signed up for other various radio positions to support the bicycle ride event. The forecast was fine. The net control plan also called for a Parker County Racies operator to work the radios in the Parker County Emergency Operations Center. This operator would be able to help with radio traffic between the fire and EMS dispatchers, the bicycle ride amateur radio net control, and the county sheriff's deputies performing traffic control at busy intersections. The usual ride startup radio traffic came and went, and then the calls for support and gear vehicle began to increase for flat tires, broken chains, muscle cramps, and exhausted riders. And then, cutting through the steady amateur radio traffic between the net control and rest stops, a support and gear vehicle operator's voice could be heard transmitting, emergency, emergency, emergency. Mike Burns, KE5NCS, was sweeping the 61-mile course northbound on Bennett Road following a pilot car and tractor lowboy trailer with a large piece of equipment. The tractor trailer high-centered and stopped on the Union Pacific Railroad crossing. And then Burns heard an eastbound train blowing its horn for the road crossing. Net Control, John Diner, N5JLD, issued a standby, 
hold all radio traffic order, and transmitted, go ahead with the emergency traffic, SAG-3. Burns then transmitted, yes, there was a low boy heavy equipment hauler with a bulldozer on it that just got high centered on the railroad tracks at Bennett Road and Goan Road. It can't move, and there's a train coming. In the EOC, the fire EMS dispatcher said, what did he just say? Just as net control N5JLD transmitted, please repeat your emergency traffic. The EOC ride control operator, Thad Wykall, KG5ATD, turned up the radio audio to near maximum so the dispatcher could hear the radio traffic clearly. As SAG-3 KE5NCS was repeating his emergency traffic, the dispatcher said, I am getting Union Pacific Railroad on the phone right now. Wycall at the EOC used a fire EMS radio to make a countywide call to the county law enforcement dispatcher. County, this is EOC ride control with emergency traffic. The county dispatcher replied, go ahead with your emergency traffic, EOC. County, the railroad tracks at Bennett and Gone Roads are blocked by a tractor trailer hauling a bulldozer and there's a train approaching. The EOC dispatcher said he has put out an all stop on all trains on that track. A county deputy asked EOC, what was that location? Bennett Road and Gone Road. Copy, I am en route, followed by radio silence. When the EOC dispatcher's phone rang, the dispatcher answered and relayed that they are showing all trains at full stop on that track. Wycall made a radio call to the county dispatcher saying, County, this is EOC ride control. Union Pacific is reporting all trains at full stop on that track at Bennett Road. County copies that, EOC. Wycall then made a radio call to the ride net control, N5JLD. Net control, this is EOC. Go ahead, EOC. Net control, Union Pacific is reporting all trains on that track at full stop. Copy that, EOC. SAG-3, net control. SAG-3, go ahead. SAG-3, EOC is reporting that Union Pacific is showing all trains at full stop on that track at Bennett Road. Uh, yeah, I can see that. The eastbound train has stopped 30 yards short of the tractor trailer. There were no injuries or equipment damage. Wycall reported the road crossing clear one and a half hours later. Yes, an amateur radio handheld can stop a train. Thanks went out to all amateur radio volunteers and fire dispatch operators for their quick effort to help narrowly prevent a disastrous collision between a train and a tractor trailer hauling a bulldozer with a gross weight of 186,000 pounds. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters around the country and around the world on great repeater systems like WA3PBD repeater system on Thursday evenings at 7.30 p.m. on 146.730 and 223.940, covering all of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and beyond. With special thanks to all our weekly news sources and to you, our listeners, that wraps up this edition of This Week in Amateur Radio. If you would like to write to us, you can find everything you need, including archive editions of the news service at our website at twiar.net. We would like to take this opportunity to let you know that This Week in Amateur Radio is produced and distributed entirely each week, by our all-volunteer nonprofit organization, and that we do incur expenses for its future operations. If you would like to support us, you can visit our web for all the information. Our address once again is www.twiar.net. And now for all of us at This Week in Amateur Radio Headquarters and all our news team around the world, this is Will Rogers, K5WLR in Fayetteville, Arkansas, wishing you 73.